God, that you would anoint Brother Candido, that he would be prepared, he would be ready, and he would teach your word, and he would take this message, bring it to our National Deaf Summit, and teach the deaf class over there, and so that some people will feel your presence, and that would lead them into being baptized in Jesus' name and being filled with the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, is that, is that clear? Can everyone see it? <laughs> um, I, when I was putting this together, um, I'm still trying to get better at this, so uh, not, not used to putting together a PowerPoint presentation, Brother Nolan was teaching me how to do it, so uh, kind of... Uh, testing out it, some some errors in, in, in making this presentation, but uh, <laughs> wanted to throw my laptop away, but, you know, have some patience. Uh, failed a couple times, but uh, this time, you know, I'm getting a little better, so this is the, this is the PowerPoint. I, I put four hours into this particular presentation. I thought, hey, it might be simple, but Brother Nolan seems to be a lot better at this than I am, because I had, I had a lot of struggles, uh, but uh, Brother Nolan taught me how to, to do this, and uh, God gives him the knowledge and the understanding in the word and of course he can then teach me but uh, so the word of God is not from us it's from God and I feel anointing God is good and I pray that uh, we would all glean from the gospels I'm going to go ahead and touch base on this before I get started um, we know in the gospels of uh, Matthew uh, Mark uh, Luke and John we all we know the, the gospels we find in our New Testament and it talks about the life of, of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus. And uh, we know that the gospel is, is the good news. It's some good information, good news that we can share with each other. Right? Uh, and and we're, we're talking about things that happened when Jesus was on, uh, on earth. Brother Nolan, I want you to jump in at any time and help me out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some verses of scripture here. Okay, uh, if, if I do uh, miss something, make sure you let me know. Thank you. So we look in Matthew 28 uh, and 18. Uh, the scripture reads, And Jesus came and spake unto them. <clears throat> them is, is the disciples that are, that are gathered around him when he's speaking. Jesus speaking, obviously. Saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So I want you to notice that key word being all. So all power, not, not some, not partial. There's no percentages of, of a breakdown. It's all in his hands, right? So everything is in that one deity. And I want you to notice this all power is given unto me, obviously being singular. That's what it's referring to, right? So we understand that Jesus is speaking. Jesus is saying, I have all power. It's all powers given unto me in heaven and in earth. Obviously, the disciples understand this. They're sitting there. They're listening to what Jesus is saying. And I'll expound on this a little later. But they're understanding what Jesus is saying. Uh, and it goes on to, to verse 19. But power in 18, if I can make a parallel, right, uh, we, have, we have the law. So we obey the law in our actions, right? So the disciples knew that we obey God in our actions. So no, no questions so far? All right. So in verse 19, it, says, it reads, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now again, I want you to notice the all. So uh, I'm going to start again here. It says, Go ye, ye speaking to the disciples, Jesus speaking to the disciples, saying therefore and teach all nations. There's no exclusions, you know, and it, it includes every nation on this planet. And there's no exceptions. I want you to notice that. There's no exceptions mentioned in this particular verse. And understand, at this particular moment, the church has yet to be established. Jesus is still on the earth 
speaking to the disciples. The church has not been established as of yet. Scripture continues baptizing them in the name of, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll get back to this, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's all in the name, right? And I want you to, I want you to notice that. It's not through these titles, and a lot of people in, our, in this world will say, you know, it's through these titles that I'm saved. And I was one of those until someone showed me the revelations, showing me that there's no power in a title. So, and, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll get to this later. I, I, I'm going to keep going, but I'll, I'll get back to this. I, if you have any questions, please do say something. Uh, just a second. So that name... Is not a plural reference, right? That name is is, and, and I'm going to ask you those those of you here are, that are here, you you understand that this name is not a plural reference. It's a, it's singular, right? So if you have the name, that's one. If you have names, what you're referring to is two or more, okay? And obviously, if we look here, we're referring to one name. Obviously, disciples who are gathered together as reference in 18 understand this. So in the name, the, uh, also referencing the singularity of the, of, the, of the name. And then, of course, it goes into the titles of this name, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So we have the Father, we have the Son, we have the Holy Ghost. Let me go ahead and focus on the Son a little bit. Let me go ahead and ask you, what's the name of the Son? Does anybody here know? Jesus, right? So you, you understand that. And then you go to the Father. What's the Father's name? Jesus. The Holy Ghost. What's the Holy Ghost's name? Jesus. There's identity in that. There's no separation. There's no, uh, uh, there's no uh, bifurcation of, of persons. They're, they're all the same. Is that clear? Amen? So and I, and I want to touch base a little bit in the beginning. It says, Go ye therefore... When Jesus ascends into heaven, this is his commandment to the disciples. There, this, is, this is what you're supposed to do when I leave earth. When my physical body is gone, you're going to do this. Any questions? Now I want you to remember, in the name. And I'm underlining it so you can, you can remember that. And it's an emphasis, right? So I want you to remember and understand what I'm referring to here. So, Candido, I'm Candido, I'm deaf, I'm a father, I have a son, I am a son, right? That's all, these are my titles under the name of Candido. Oh, he wants to jump in here, go ahead. So, I want to, I want to add something here, and there's one part here that I want to jump in and make, make a comment here, but what we need to do is we need to focus on the name, right? We need to focus on that. Um... We need to focus on this particular portion of the scripture because Matthew is writing this. Matthew writes in the name, right? Matthew puts the emphasis in the name, not in the titles. The titles are supporting evidence of the name, right? And if you, if you were to change your focus, you would confuse the intent of the scripture, right? So it's in the name of, and then titles of this individual. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So you have to remember, this is supporting evidence pointing back to who this person is. This person is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is Jesus. But they didn't say it. And some people, some people will be in that position where they'll understand it, but they won't admit it. Right? But we need to understand that there's, there's identity in the Son. And through that, we find the identities of the Father and the Holy Ghost because they're all in Him. Thank you, but thank you. That that was that was clear, brother Noah. That was clear. Um, the and can be translated to also in the original, so you can change it. So it's Father, also Son, also Holy Ghost, right? And again, this goes back to the point of supporting evidence of the name. Is that clear? 
Now, if you look in uh, Mark, uh, and I'm and I'm going through different gospels here. I just went through Matthew. There's going to be Mark, Luke, and John. And I want you to. I'm trying to show you something here. Maybe if you see things from a different perspective, um, Brother Nolan, he he explains it really well. I don't. Can you can you explain that you were talking about symbolism in the, in the perspectives? So the four gospel writers, each of them have different perspectives of the event, right? But in, in reality, when you look at every story, they're talking about the same story. So let me give you an example. So you have the four gospel writers. Uh, you have Matthew, who says, knock on the door, and, you know, say the IRS, you owe the IRS money. Some of you are probably thinking, oh, have I made, made, made sure I pay my taxes? Don't worry, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not, I'm not anybody important. But <clears throat> Matthew said, you know, when Matthew was knocking on the door, at, so, and I'm just going to use an example. We'll say there's an intersection here, and Matthew walks up to this door and knocks on the door. Luke is in the hospital on the, the third or fourth floor, so to speak. Let's say that, you know, and he's in there, and He's there, and he doesn't see what's going on. Mark, Mark is a young man. He, he may have been driving a hot rod around town, putting gas in his car at the particular instance, maybe on the other side of that intersection. And John, John is different. John is riding in the vehicle with Jesus. They're close. That's why we see John the Beloved, right? That's why he's called John the Beloved. He's the one that's side by side with Jesus. So Jesus is say driving the, the the he's driving Lyft, so to speak. Let's just say that for those Lyft drivers out there. Jesus is driving a Lyft. Uh, John's in the vehicle. He pumps on his brakes, gets in a car accident. Matthew is knocking on the door, hears a car accident, turns around, sees it from the outside. So he reports it to the police. Obviously, the police is going to want all of the information. So the police is going to gather all witness statements to understand the situation fully. So if you say somebody wants to study about your life, you're going to collect information not from one person but from multiple people to make a book or a biography about somebody's life, right? I don't, I don't know about much about your life, so don't worry about it. <laughs> but Matthew, and if I, like I, I place these people around... Matthew turns around, hears the, the, the brakes screeching, sees the incident from this house that he's on at the intersection. Now, Luke, Luke doesn't see what's going on. He hears everything, says, hey, what's up? Luke typically writes in great detail. He's really good at writing in detail. I don't know if you've noticed that in the book of Luke. He writes in great detail. I do like reading some of Luke's writings, and we know that he, he was a doctor, so that's probably why. But from that instance, he heard it. Now he's going to go gather the information. So he asks a lot of different people about the incident. Now, Mark is young. Mark is at, you know, at the gas station. He's collecting information from other people as well. So I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to show you is each person writes about the same instance, but they're in different places at different at, at the same time. So they're trying to gather all of this information to write about the same story. Is that 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 that's a clear point. I, I like that I like that is an example of the different perspectives of the different writers in the gospels. Mark has witnessed certain things that, that Jesus has done, but understand he's doing it from a different perspective uh, from the other gospel writers. If you look in 16, verse 15 here, it says, And he, this, he is Jesus, said unto them, Go ye into all the world. And I want you to again notice the key word being all the world. And preach the gospel, the good news, to every creature. That, cre that word creature means person, right? To everybody. There's no exceptions. There's no, you don't get it, but you do. It's to every creature, right? All the, Going ye into all the world and preach to every creature. Okay? Well, I hope that's clear. Amen? 
Now understand, this is not when baptism was happening. The church has yet to start here. The church comes in later. The church comes in after this, right? Jesus is speaking to the disciples here, but you see in verse 16, he, that, that he in verse 16 is referencing anybody, basically saying anybody that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned, which, you, which references a punishment or a judgment, right? right? So if you're not believing and you don't act upon the commandments of Jesus, you, you're, there's going to be a consequence for those actions. So he that believeth and is baptized, you've got, you've got to do both. You've got to obey and you've got to be baptized. If you don't, Obviously, the, the consequences are, are quite severe. This is Jesus speaking. This is not from anybody else's mouth, so to speak. And this is referencing the, the birth of the church coming in the future. And all, all of these disciples that are gathered together listening to us understand this. Amen? Any questions? So I want to bring in a good uh, comment here and it could be for his benefit that and again can be changed to also I mean that that and is is uh, in the original you can change certain things right so you have to not only do you have to believe which is important but you also have to be baptized because if you don't believe that that unbelief is not going to lead you to being baptized the, 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 the emphasis here is in belief. You've got to believe it because belief leads to action, right? And that's what we find in our Bibles. That belief will then lead you to, of course, there's repentance, and then you, you're, in, you're filled with the Holy Ghost, and then you're baptized. So that, that and can change, be changed to also in this particular instance as well. It says this person that believes is also baptized, so you've got to do both, and then you will be saved, shall be saved. You can't just pick and choose and say, well, I believe, therefore I don't need to be baptized. That's, that's not the full equation. You get rid of one. If you get rid of baptism, your belief is worthless. Because belief, if you were to truly believe, you need to act on those beliefs. So you connect that belief in baptism, and then that leads you to be saved. I, I hope you're, you're benefiting from this, Brother Kingito. Um, I, I wrote that down for you, too. You will find later on in the verse... <clears throat> It says, but, and, and Brother Candido, you had mentioned this, this is anybody, he, that he right there is referencing anybody, but he that believeth not, there's a consequence for that. Because if you don't believe, it's not going to lead you to baptism. So it's important that you believe the word of God that leads you then unto baptism. And Mark understands, obviously, what he's talking about when he writes this. He's gathering all this information and he writes it here and we see it in verse 16, but he knows exactly what's going on. Now if we look at the book of Luke, chapter 24, verse 47. And, 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 and Brother Nolan made reference to this, but Luke is writing... After the fact, he's gathering information from other eyewitnesses. He's asking people. He's gathering information and putting it down and recording it in his book. So he's got a, he's got a unique perspective. We read in verse 47, it says, And that repentance and remission, which means forgiveness. So and remission of sins or forgiveness of sins should be preached. I want you to notice remission or forgiveness of sins. And that's not just some of your sins or that's a partial forgiveness or a quarter. That's not what it's referencing. Obviously, it's referencing a full remission, a full forgiveness of sins should, should be preached in his name among all nations. And again, I want to point you back to that word, all nations. Beginning where, obviously, we see at Jerusalem.
and I don't know, some people have different signs to the word Jerusalem, but that's where it begins. And the disciples understand this. They understand the perspective, they understand the promise, they understand what's being spoken. Now, I hope this is making sense so far. And again, I, I do want to focus on that. It says all nations. There's no, there's no exceptions. I, I really want to emphasize that. There's no exceptions. There's no uh, 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 groups that are eliminated or nations that are eliminated from this, regardless of who you are and what nationality and what background and ethnicity you come from. I mean, even Hitler could have been saved. Who knows? If you're from Pakistan, Italy, France, does not matter where you're from. There's no exceptions. Anybody can be saved. But understand, this is again written before the, the establishment of the church. The, the establishment, the birth of the church comes shortly after. Mm -hmm. And I want you to, I'm underlining in his name. Because again, we're referencing the initial verse of scripture that I had underlined. In his name, that doesn't change. Even though there's a different perspective, that key portion of the scripture is still there. <coughs> Matthew 28, 19 says, in the name of who? The Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, the supporting evidence of who this person is. Matthew writes this. Mark writes what we just read. They didn't make any, there, there's no distinction. If we see in Luke, in his name, there's a singular name that it's referencing. And in Matthew, it's also that singular name that's referenced. Matthew 28, 19 says, in the Father, you know, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, and we find the, the identity of the Son is in the name. So then, of course, we understand that the identity of the Father is in the name and of the Holy Ghost is in the name. And in Luke, we see in his name, singular again. If there is a plurality or a duplicitous nature of, of, of God, then it should be in reference of a plural names or their names. So, Brother Nolan, just really explain it really well. Thank you, Brother Nolan. So we look at the book of John, it's going to be a little different. John writes from a completely different perspective than the first three. And uh, I, this is kind of a longer slide, and, and it's going to be a little more explanation. I tried to shorten it as best as I could, but uh, if we look in John, John's writing this. Uh, I just lost my train of thought. Anyways, um, so we look here at John chapter 3. Verse 3, scripture reads, Jesus answered and said unto him, uh, we go down, Nicodemus, okay, he's speaking to Nicodemus here. That him in verse 3 is referencing Nicodemus, and we see his name obviously in verse 4. I didn't mean to jump around there for a second, but verse 3 continues, says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, and that verily is truthfully, or truly, if I can change that so you understand. It's, I'm, I'm listen here, I'm, I'm getting ready to tell you something important. I'm, I'm being truthful here. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All right, Brother Nolan, you want to you explain that? It says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Brother Nolan, I know you have a good example about this, and I forgot to, to put it down on this slide, but I want you to share it. If I can use this cup as an example of being born again, right? The key is if you look, I, I want you to focus right here. There's a particular word here, except, and in sign language, we sign it this way. Except, right? Understand when the hearing people, hearing people may understand the English. Uh, and, and the rules that are applied here a little differently than us deaf people will because the picture isn't always clear with the way we sign it, right? According to this particular verse of scripture, we shouldn't be signing it this way because it's contextually wrong, right? Except, except should be like this. Except a man be born again. And this, we're speaking to, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. Instead of using this, except a man, be born again instead of signing that way sign it this way if you sign it that way it's 
more conceptually accurate. If you don't do this, you cannot, right? Therefore, you need to do this, okay? Now, if, if let, me, let me go ahead and show you a, a neat little trick here. If you take accept, if you were to take that out of the verse of scripture, but in doing so, you also change cannot into can, then sign that verse of scripture. So you take not and accept, take them out. It says, I, I read the whole thing, take accept out and not out of cannot, read it. So he says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, a man be born again, he can see the kingdom of God. Okay, there we go. Is that clear? There we go, that's the answer. So, and, and uh, I'm going to add that on your notes, Brother Candido, but that right there, if you ain't put accept and cannot, it means the same thing as if you were to take accept and not out, right? So this is in done for emphasis. If you do not do this, you cannot have this. That's good. I, that's good. Yeah. But I, I, I like that. It's an, it's an emphasis. So you, it's your choice to accept it, right? And if you don't choose to accept it, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Um, verse 4, I don't know his sign names. I don't know Nicodemus. Who sign, how do you sign Nicodemus? I, anyways, you know that obviously we know the story of Nicodemus. I'm, I'm trying to, to, to speed up here. I don't want to take too much time. But Nicodemus, in verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, him being Jesus. Nicodemus is perplexed, obviously, by what Jesus just said, doesn't understand. So he says, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter? This is, this is something he's confused about, right? He says, how can a man be born again? Or how, um, how can a man be born when he is old? So he's like, he's thinking, I'm old. I'm not going to be born again. I, I can't. That doesn't make any sense. The scripture continues. He says, can he enter the second time? Can he enter the second? Thank you, Brother Noah. Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? So he's saying, how does that happen? I don't understand. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Right? And we see in verse John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus like with, with patience answers. Verse 5 reads, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water. That water is, uh, is baptism, right? Okay. That water is referencing baptism. And of the, the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So if you do not do these things, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Those two parts, obviously, being baptism and being born of the Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Verse 6 says, which, uh, that which is born of flesh, born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, right? So... If it's got a fleshly birth, it's flesh. If it's got a spiritual birth, it's spirit. When we are born into the family of God, that's why it's important that we are born of spirit, right? We've already experienced the birth in, of, of flesh. We're, we're in this world, we've experienced that. But we can also experience the spiritual birth of receiving the infilling of the Holy Ghost and being baptized in Jesus' name. And if you do not experience that, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Anyways, verse 7 continues. It says, marvel not. So basically, don't be shocked that I say that I said unto thee, you must, and this is Jesus, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. So don't be shocked that I'm saying this, but you've got to be born again. Sign, sign, uh, sign this particular verse of scripture again and get rid of the accept and then the not. Right, so sign that again. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, 
a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he can enter into the kingdom of God. So, and again, that goes into, marvel not, I say unto thee, you must be born again. So John's writing this, and again, it's from a different perspective than some of the other gospel writers, but we know that John, I, I have some historical facts of when he wrote it. I believe it's like, is it 80, 80, 80 or something? Uh, 90, 80, 80, somewhere around there. Yeah, it's, there's, there's some historical findings of when he wrote this. John writes this after the, after the establishment of the church, right? He's explaining that, that basically the history and, and the ministry of Jesus when he was on earth. I got a question. Except a man be born again. A man? Who's that? Who's a man? A man is anybody. Except anybody. It, it's you, it references humanity. It references people, right? So there's no, there's no exceptions. There's no, there's no one special person above the rest, right? Everybody gets to go through the same experience. You are born again, you are saved. If you, if you are not born again, you are not saved. Does that make sense? So that's what it, that's, it's saying that to everybody. It's to anybody. We can say ye, ye is you, basically, and, and, and Jesus is saying this to Nicodemus, right? Jesus is saying, everybody needs to be born again, but don't you be shocked that I'm saying this, because you do too, essentially. That man, if you see in verse 20, is referencing anybody. But Jesus, he said Jesus answered, but... I guess Nicodemus may have been confused thinking that being born again meant being born again and just being born through a fleshly womb, right? Nicodemus is understanding what Jesus was talking about, but he didn't understand the context of how it was to be done. How am I going to be born again? How am I supposed to enter a second time? He understands that recreation part. He understands that rebirth part. But he's saying, I don't understand how that's to be done because I'm not going to enter into my mother's womb again. Most people won't even ask that question. They'll just close their eyes and say, no, I'm fine. That's a good point. Jesus is good at being able to talk about it and then apply it to you specifically. And we see that in verse 7. All right. Now we look in chapter 7, verse 38. This is what I find absolutely fascinating. And John obviously understands this. And John writes this, uh, writing what Jesus was saying all those years ago before he ascended into heaven. But understand, Jesus is writing this after the, or uh, John is writing this after the infilling of the Holy Ghost, after the establishment of the church, and we find it about 85, 90 A.D. Uh, that we see John writing his gospel. Okay. So chapter seven, verse thirty-eight. This is this is Jesus speaking before the establishment of the church. Jesus speaking, saying, he, again, that's referenced, anybody, any person, he that believeth, he that believeth on me, and that me, in that particular verse of scripture, is Jesus speaking about himself. If you believe in me, or you believe on me, there's no us, there's no we, it's me, right? <clears throat> and I find this fascinating. He that believeth on me, again, this is really reinforcing that singular nature of the name. As, as the, scripture, the scripture reads here, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So that's, a, that's referencing the Holy Ghost. John understands this. He adds it here if, if in the, the verse 39. John adds this, right? This is John speaking in verse 39 saying, but this spake he, he hears Jesus, but this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, right? So Jesus is on earth. There's no Holy Ghost to be poured out at, at that particular moment. 
the disciples are following and listening to what Jesus has to say. Jesus is saying things that the disciples are, are holding on to and, and trying to record, right? And at that point, he has yet to be ascended into heaven, right? He's on earth still. But we see that reference here because Jesus was not yet glorified. We see that in verse 39 at the very end. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus has yet to be ascended into heaven and then have his spirit feel his spirit fill humanity. It has yet to happen, right, at that particular moment. Obviously, it does happen later, but that's what John is referencing in verse 39. Yes, John, yeah. No. John, John the Beloved, the one that follows Jesus around, the one that, different from John the Baptist. John the Baptist, John the Beloved are different, right? John the Baptist, yes, is cousins with Jesus, but John the Beloved is different. John the Baptist did not write the book of John. This is a different John. This John is one of the disciples Jesus chose, then becomes an apostle. Right? Right. John, one, two, three, first, second, third John, you have that, you have this John. Um, John writes these things. So this book was not written during the life of Jesus, right? John, John experienced a martyr's death, and it was it was gruesome. But anyways, I do need to add this, and it's really important because John wrote this having already been filled with the Holy Ghost, so he knows what this is referencing. John's trying to explain this, what Jesus has said in verse 39, right? John, in verse 39, is explaining what was said in verse 38. He knows. He's experienced it. He knows what it's referencing. So then he goes into, obviously, in verse 39, the explanation. But this spake he of the Spirit, <coughs> which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given. That Holy Ghost is rivers of living water, right? That has yet to be given. Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus had yet to be ascended into heaven. Therefore, Holy Ghost has yet to fall. But in the ascension of Jesus, obviously, I'll get there. Anyways. So we look in the book of Acts. <laughs> All right. So if you look in the book of Acts. Uh... Peter, Peter understands this. He understands everything that's being said. He was there with the gospel writers. You read in verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, this, this is the multitude of people hearing what Peter has to say. Peter had just got done preaching. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And, uh, sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm jumping around a little. I'm going to go back. Again, it reads, uh, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles. So the people that, that were standing next to Peter. This is what they say. They say, they, or they're, they're speaking to not only to Peter, but to the rest of the apostles that are that are standing next to Peter. Uh, rest does not reference relax. Rest means the remainder. Okay, yeah. So the rest of the apostles, uh, it's Peter and then the rest of them, the remainder. Okay, and this is what they say. They say, men and brethren. But I, I, I want to make sure you point, I want to point this out here before we continue. If you take a bunch of pennies and you were to drop it out and you picked up a couple of them and I said, you can have the rest of the pennies. That means whatever is left, the remainder is all yours, right? So the rest of the disciples, so there's one Peter, the remainder of them. I'm sorry, I did, I'm not standing here, so thank you for that. Uh, 
rest isn't referencing relaxing. And again, I'm going to share this illustration. Uh, if you take a bunch of pennies, you were to dump it out on a table, I was to take a few of them and say, you can have the rest of the pennies, right? The rest of them means the remainder. You can have the rest of them, right? That's what the rest in this particular verse of scripture is, 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 is insinuating, right? It's not insinuating relaxing. It's saying Peter and then the others, the rest of the apostles. Who, who are these apostles? Obviously, we, we know. Yes, the, in this picture, they're standing next to them. And that's all it's, 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 that's all the, the scripture's talking about. There's 120. They're out there doing their thing. But what the scripture makes reference to is the apostles. Okay? And then uh, we know that Peter, obviously, was the one that, that preached to the multitude and, and, and we see there, this is their response. They say men and brethren, but men is not only men. Men means men and women. It's basically people. Hey, what shall we do? So they're, they're, they, they, they're understanding what's being preached and they're saying, what do we do? What do we do about this? This is Acts. We understand that the book of Acts talks about the establishment of the church, the, the founding of the church. This is the day it started. And it's clear that Peter at this point had just got over preaching in verse two or chapter 2, verse 37. Peter just got done preaching, and this is their response. They're, and I, I know I'm jumping over. I'm skipping a few things. I understand that. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll make sure to include some more information. I, I, this, this is my first time using it like this, so no, I'm okay so far. Okay. So again, the, the multitude uh, are, are, have been pricked in their heart. They're, they, they feel something, right? But imagine if nothing, there was no message that had been preached, right? That's, if nothing had been preached, there would have been nothing to cause them to ask, what, what shall we do? Obviously, it's due to the sermon of Peter that they start to say, men and brethren, what shall we do? It's like, hey, I feel this. What do I do? When we look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Scripture reads that Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, that's a gift, right? And there's, there's, that's, that's the response Peter has to the question, but I want you to notice something. In the name. Now, that's, there's no change between in the name in 2819 and Acts chapter 2, verse 38. All of these gospel writers write about the name, but there's no church at that point. In Acts, we find the establishment of the church, and we also find the same reference to the name. Right? This is, this is, the, this is the establishment of the church, and when they preach this message, they point out what the name is. And, and, I, and I'm jumping around here. And is it okay if I backtrack a little bit? I'm going gonna, gonna to go back. Uh, well, for, before I do that, do we have any questions? We understand what's... Uh, verse 39 says, For the promise is unto you. Oh, sorry. Let me, let me, let me backtrack here. I want you to notice... Repentance is, I'm doing my thing, I'm changing it, now I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm leaving, I'm separating myself from the world, I'm changing my direction, and I'm headed towards Jesus. And it continues, obviously, being baptized, every one of you, in the name. Obviously, we understand that there's power in the identity of the name. So, in the name of who? Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins, as the scripture reads, and it's important... It's all of your sins that are going to be forgiven. There's no, there's no fraction or percentage that is going to be forgiven. So the scripture then continues, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This, this has happened, right? Any questions? Okay, again, then verse 39, for the promise. This is Peter speaking, for the promise is unto you, and... 
this is to all those that, that had just this all those that, that was in the multitude that was being spoken to up to this point. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off that continues generationally, right? Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Right? That's a generational thing. So from generation to generation until today, nothing has changed. There's still the church. We still preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no change from then until now. So let me ask you the question. When was the church built? B-U-I-L-T. Oh, I misspelled it. I misspelled it. Uh, <laughs> um, I misspelled it. Okay, my mistake. Good catch. Okay. So let me ask you a question. When was the church built? In which book do we find the establishment of the church? No, not all of them. When does the church, when, which book do we find the establishment of the church? No, no. Yeah, he knows. He knows. He got it right. Acts. We see the establishment of the church in the book of Acts. Okay? And we find that through baptism in Jesus' name, the remission of your sins and the feeling of the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts, that that's when the church is built, right? In the, in the Gospels, we find that Jesus is still on earth. There's not going to be an establishment of the church while his physical body is on earth, right? Once he is ascended into heaven, that's when his spirit comes down and fills us, and that's where we find the establishment of the church. Brother Candido, you can use uh, there's you can use a chair as an example, right? So if I was to say, if I was to put this up here. You can use this chair as an example, right? At the conference, if, you, if this is the message or the lesson that you're going to teach, you can say, hey, let me use this as an example because we see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We find those four Gospels. If we were to get rid of them, there would be no church. There would be no church. The, ch the message of the church depends on the Gospel, the ministry of Jesus Christ, right? So Matthew 28, and you just referenced that verse of scripture, what you can talk about is you can label. So you can say, hey, I'm going to take this. I'm going to sticky it. I'm going to put a little sticky note on this chair. And so it's more of a visual thing so deaf people can depend on that, right? More visual representations or displays are, are much more uh, uh, conceptually, uh, you can grasp it better, right? So if it's tape or, or a sticky note or whatever, post it, you stick it on a chair, share a second one. So... You put it on it, so you say Matthew 28, and you know what you just shared. That's on this leg. You go to Mark. So say this leg is Matthew, that leg is Mark. You put a little post-it note on that leg. You share the scripture. You explain about it. Then you move on to the third leg. So you have Matthew, Mark. You go on to Luke. You you sticky note it. You sticky note the fourth one is John. So once you get to when you get done, you say these four legs depend on each other because if you don't have them, you don't have a foundation, right? If you get rid of the four legs. What message can be preached? There's nothing there. You've never heard about the ministry and the life of Jesus, so why would the book of Acts be important? Right? So these four Gospels, they're not in disagreement or, or they don't contrast each other in any way. They all work together. They all work together to make one narrative, and it's the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And Peter understands this. Not only did Peter understand this and preach it, yes, Peter started to preach it, and yes, the other disciples followed him, they also preach the same message, right? So you, once you point out the four legs, you point out the foundation, you get there, you kind of like pump it up. It's really important to, 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 to build that uh, a mental image. And once you get done with that, and then of course, and I'm sure that, you know, the conference still have chairs that you can use, but not foldable chairs. You don't want to stand on those. Those are bad. But... You could, what you can say is, is you're telling everybody who's willing to stand and preach, right? And you'll, you'll get there. Peter's the one that stands up and preach. But Peter stands up and preach on the foundation that the Gospels have laid out for him, right? So 
you have all four legs serving as the foundation, as the thing that Peter can then stand on and preach in the book of Acts, right? And that's where we find the foundation of the church, is on the foundation of four gospels. And without that, you don't have the church and you don't have the, the, the gospels we know today because nobody was never going to ever hear or understand about the life and ministry of Jesus. Therefore, you're going to be following Old Testament traditions and sacrificing animals, etc., etc. And we find in the book of Luke and the book of John, uh, Mark and Matthew, in the, in the Old Testament, before those are written, there's prophecy of the Old Testament being poured out, right? And we see a lot of those prophecies being fulfilled, not only in the Gospels, but in the book of Acts, right? So we, we see that all four of these Gospels are the foundation upon which the book of Acts is built. Yes, please do share. So Peter standing on the foundation. Now go back, I think it was two or three slides. Can you, you want to go back a couple? Just to that picture that you had. There you go. Now you see Peter, right? Peter's here. Peter's proclaiming the verse of scripture as we see it in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The disciples or the apostles at this point are not in disagreement of what's being said. They're in full of, uh, they're they're in one accord. They all agree. They all heard the, 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 the words of, of Jesus in Matthew 28, 19. Fast forward to 238. They have they, they don't disagree with what, what Peter is saying. Obviously, they understand it as spoken in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And they don't, at any point, disciples don't jump in and say, well, you forgot the other titles. You, you're not referencing yet. That's not, because they understand the intention of the message. They understand the intent of what was being said. Furthermore, Jesus had spoke to all of the disciples, and saying, ye, go ye therefore, to all of these disciples. Then, of course, they turn around, and they then fulfill the intent of, of the message and, and, and preaching the gospel, beginning in Jerusalem, as the prophecy says, and then spreading out to the world. So everything fits, and thank you, Brother Mike, for adding that. I appreciate it. Uh, and again, I do want to emphasize, I want us to point out and understand that throughout this, it's all in the name. There's no plurality. There's no duplicitous nature of deities. It's just Jesus. That's the name. The end. Speaking to the disciples, you know, saying that they need to go and to preach the gospel and start the church, and they'll then start the church in the book of Acts. But uh, Peter's the one that starts it, right? G Peter, Jesus picked Peter to start the church, right? Well, understand, once he starts, everybody follows, right? Jesus, uh, Peter's to start it, everybody also is to work in it, though, right? Peter's picked to start it, they're all picked to work with it. So if you see these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this is obviously the, the life and the ministry of, of Jesus. We get to the book of Acts. Right at the end, obviously, of the Gospels, we find the ascension of Jesus. Jesus is there. Jesus is not on the earth as a physical being. Then uh, we see in the book of Acts, the establishment of the church. That's when the Spirit comes down and lives in us. Uh, we find that through the Holy Ghost, we speak in other tongues, and we find that in the book of Acts. Um, but it's, it's important to understand that the Gospels... Without that, we don't have the church, right? And, 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 and you see that when Peter preaches, Peter makes references to prophecies in the book of Joel, right? So, or the prophet Joel, rather. He makes references to, to, to those prophecies, so. I, I, I like that illustration of the chair. It was, I'm definitely going to benefit from that and, and try to use that in the National Death Summit. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad he uh, taught this uh, lesson uh, and he's getting ready for it. Um, he has all of his, his notes. And uh, again, if you any of your questions do help him out in order to uh, prepare for the questions that could be asked when he's over there. So um, I asked him to go ahead and, and teach. Um, and before he started, he was getting really nervous. And he says, well, I don't really feel called to do it. I said, no. If you depend on feelings, you'll never get anywhere. Right? 
If I have to prompt you, that's different. If I say, hey, let's do this challenge, that's a different story, right? We see in the, in the, in the Bible where we see Peter on the boat. He's in a boat. It's a comfortable place, right? Jesus then says, launch out into the deep, right? So at that point, you have to get uncomfortable. You have to leave the safety of the shallow waters. So that's basically what I encouraged him. I said, just keep going, continue, pray, study, you'll get there. The challenge is there and it's always gonna be there. I'm challenged every day, everybody, and I, and I encourage you to go through that. So any, any questions, nothing, anything you wanna add? Maybe something that we missed, I missed. Oh, I, I guess I already, I already documented that on the notes. Um, Matthew 16, yeah, Matthew 16, 18, yeah. Do you want to say something or no? Okay. He wants to see that picture. Can we go back to the picture? You said both men and women, but I, I don't, it says men and brethren. But you said men and brethren is men and women. I don't see women. I see two. I see two. Men and brethren. Hold on. Let me let me go ahead and see. If you look, they. Who's they? The people. So this is, they are then pricked in their hearts. They said unto Peter, and the rest of the apostles, to the people that are standing up there, they say, men and brethren, referencing directly to these people, saying, what shall we do? Right. So you, in old English, men, men references men and women. But brethren obviously can be brothers and sisters, right? So understand that there's there's a possibility of, of women being involved a part as well, right? Point is the point of the story isn't the men and brethren part. It's what shall we do? That's the point of the, the question. There's another verse of scripture here. I can't I can't remember it right off the top of my head. Uh, Romans chapter 5 verse 12 I believe it's referencing men but in reality the word is men but it's referencing <laughs> men and women let's see if I can just pull it up <coughs> a man must be born a man must be born again it again is referencing to anybody not just just men biologically it's, it's referencing men and women that's what the scripture is referencing when they say men. It's not excluding women at all. So it's anybody. So you can say, you must be, uh, there's one baptism, one church, you must be born again. Uh, point of the story, the point is, is there's all this extra stuff, it's basically, what are you saying, right? So one church, one, one faith, one baptism. <laughs> awesome, amen. Could you put your hand down? All right, uh, yes, yes, we're going to pray in closing here. Okay, uh, I want to thank Brother Candido for his time and, and his, his, his 
effort. And this is going to definitely help them out. And we always need to, to get better. We always need to strive for better. The more we read the Bible, the more we glean from it, the more we understand from it. But we don't need to be uh, uh, closed off in our approach to the Bible. We need to read it and understand it, right? So again, I appreciate, Brother Canada, your time and, and, your, and, your, and your lesson this morning. I really appreciate it. Um, now, Brother Jeff is going to be doing it next uh, Sunday. Uh, so let's go ahead and pray in closing. Thank you, Jesus, for your word that you've given to us. Uh, and, and, and understanding and analyzing your word and, and we all can get better in understanding your word and I pray that you would bless us at Nor uh, National Death Summit 